See, this is what I like to see is a speaker bringing their entire class in here. Um, I'm going to do some announcements a little bit early today. Um, oh, thank you. Um, we're transitioning from the ebullient sounds of Thelonious Monk, thank you David Burroughs, um, into uh, today's program. Um, if you have never been to Great Decisions, uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Tim DeRoche, I'm the Director of Programs for World Oregon. World Oregon has been a wonderful, um, or not World Oregon, PSU has been a wonderful partner of ours for a number of years on this program. We actually started doing Great Decisions here at PSU in 1953. So um, it is a venerable heritage uh, brand at this point. Um, uh, we have been sending some things out this week. Um, it's our 70th anniversary. I don't know if you know that. We were founded in 1950. And we were founded in 1950 to connect Oregonians to the world and find uh, platforms for us to talk about our global responsibility and how we can um, create actionable solutions for a more peaceful planet. And um, I sent out a thing earlier this week. We're going to be doing an exhibition at the Oregon Historical Society that's going up in April, asking people if you have historically significant photos or ephemera, um, T-shirts, perhaps a Great Decisions book from 1964 <laughs> with such trenchant issues as World Communism Today, How Great the Danger. Or some things just don't change. Egypt in the Middle East, what prospects for stability? Um, so if you've got great photos, like I just found some fantastic photos of Gerald Ford from 1977 speaking to our members. If you've got things like that lurking about, um, get in touch with me at, uh, at World Oregon. It's timd at worldoregon.org. And um, we would love to see what you have. As per usual, I'm going to hit you up about the International Speaker Series, which kicked off last month with Samantha Power and is kicking back into gear on the 19th with uh, General H.R. McMaster, who will be here, uh, considering all of the kerfuffle that has been going on in D.C. It should be a very uh, interesting discussion, considering he did some time in the, uh, in the Trump administration. And single tickets go on sale for the remaining three events on Monday, February 10th. So you can, if you're not going to buy all three, you can get a ticket for one of them or two of them or three of them. Anyway, so also today what I would love to do is, you see this thing that says survey? If you registered for this program, you just received an email because we know where you live. Um, <laughs> And we just sent an email to you that has this link in it. Um, but otherwise, if you go on your smartphone, because I bet most of you have a smartphone. I know I saw some of you actually reading newspapers, which is really cool. But um, <laughs> if, you, if you go on your smartphone and you get onto the PSU guest, that is the, that is the Wi-Fi in this room, there's about five questions. And they help us understand what we're doing with the program, um, how your experience has been, what you think of the speakers, um, little things like that. It helps us really think about how we, um, how we measure our impact and hopefully improve what we do in the future. So um, as the program is going on, um, you could click on it right now or as we go into the Q&A, do it then uh, because you might want to evaluate the quality of today's speaker, who is um, awesome, and I will introduce in just a moment. So, Cardoza. SurveyMonkey slash r slash Great Decisions 2020. It is also in your your inbox. Um, coming up next week, we have Karen Sherman, who founded the first women's college in Rwanda, who will be here in conversation with Lisa Shannon. Uh, Lisa Shannon, for many years, lived here in Portland. She's now up in Seattle. She is a uh, wonderful uh, activist for women's issues and African issues. And Karen Sherman was actually a U of O grad. And she will be here February 12th in our offices uh, down on Broadway, 1207 Southwest Broadway. You can go to our website, which is worldoregon.org, and you can uh, register for it. She's got a brand new book about women's opportunity. 
and um, it's, uh, it should be a really rich conversation. And the other thing we're doing is uh, we just sent out a save the date. We do a fundraiser every May, May 1st. It is World Quest. It is international trivia. It is more fun than any other uh, fundraiser or gala or benefit you will go to in this town. And um, you can fight me on it, but um, it is. Uh, what we do is we sell tables. We will have PSU competing against Lewis and Clark and Columbia Sportswear competing against Nike. And um, so all these people who are involved in international business who think that they're smarty pants, they put together tables. We, um, we feed them, yeah, maybe give no, them a little bit mine. of wine. Go they raise money for a good cause. And um, so look out for that. You can find information on our website. And um, it really is fun. People get in costume. And um, it's not like those other fundraisers you go to where there's some boring auction and you know really dry chicken. I mean, this is, uh, this is primo stuff. So May 1st. Mark that in your Outlook calendars or on your abacus or however you keep track of the world. And um, we hope to see you there. Uh, what else? Do you have your books? How many of you have bought a Great Decisions book? How many of you haven't? Why not? <laughs> OK, well, we've got them out there. Um, $32 for you from Good Family and member of World Oregon, 35 for um, the general public. And um, all of that goes into helping support the programs that we do. Reminder that we are live streaming this. So when we get to the Q&A, you need to be on the mic and you also need to mind your P's and Q's because uh, it's going out into the world and you know the NSA knows where you live too. So um, uh, we also have the first three uh, installments of this series up on our YouTube channel. So if you missed one of them, um, you can go to the YouTube and search World Oregon and you can find the first three. This one will probably be up um, you know, right before next week's series. Also a reminder that on the 21st, when we talk about uh, Red Sea security, we are not having a speaker. We're going to be watching the Great Decisions on PBS series narrated by David Strathairn, who has a much better voice than I do. And, um, it's about 26 minutes long, and then what we'll do is I've got a series of questions that I'm going to pose to you, and we're going to have... So it's kind of like having a, a Great Decisions discussion group. So no speaker that day. It's a really good episode. There's an awful lot going on in that region uh, in between, you know, Yemen, Horn of Africa, Saudis. Um, in fact, I'm sure there's something in the 1964 book that is just as relevant. <laughs> anyway. To today's program, um, I'm very excited. Um, Chris Carey is one of my one of my favorite PSU people. Uh, great speaker. He has spoken for us uh, many times in the past for educator forums, for youth forums, uh, for public programs. He has been a great uh, resource for our international visitor program for folks who have been coming to Portland to look at issues around human trafficking. He is an associate professor in the Department of Criminology and Criminal Justice, and he is affiliated with the School of Community Health and the University Studies Program. He is an expert in law with an emphasis on human rights, environmental advocacy, and community engagement and local governance. He's worked for more than 15 years in research projects and community engagement programs in the US, Asia, Mexico, including projects supported by the US State Department and USAID. A former deputy district attorney, he has a wide range of criminal and civic experience, including uh, prosecuting environmental crimes, and he has worked in India, Nepal, Bangladesh, Cambodia, Mexico, and several Pacific Island nations around questions of rule of law, human trafficking, governance, and community health issues. He's published and taught widely on the local governance dimensions of issues such as human trafficking, environmental conservation, migration, and community health. And most recently, he partnered with the U.S. Attorney's Office and co-authored his study on commercial sexual exploitation of children in Portland. Actually, I think this is an old bio. This is actually, what, a six-year-old study, Chris? Yep. Yep. You bet. Uh, but every bit as um, relevant and if, if, um, if probably not worse than it was then, is my guess. <laughs> so um, 
He's previously taught a year-long first-year seminar on globalization and other courses around health law, policy, and human rights. His current partnerships include the U.S. Attorney's Office, the Department of Human Services, Mercy Corps, and the Oregon Advocacy Commission. And let us give a big hand to Chris Carey. Okay, great. Thanks everybody for coming on a uh, Friday afternoon uh, to listen and talk about this topic. And um, one of the things I want to um, kind of just modify uh, from what Tim say is, I know not everybody bought the, the book and the chapter, but how many people have actually read it, read the chapter? <laughs> and you notice I'm looking at my students right there because all of their hands should be going up right now. Okay, you guys are exempt, okay. So, uh, yeah, they know I'll see them on Monday. So, uh, I thank you again for coming. Uh, this is a topic that I've been involved in uh, for quite some time, actually more uh, that is old because it would be great if it was only 15 years, but it's been longer than that. So I started working on, and just a little bit of my background, I'm an associate professor here a long time ago. I was a deputy district attorney working on a variety of issues before I transitioned into law. And I started working on this topic actually in about 2007 and 2008 in South Asia where I ended up uh, doing my dissertation work. And I was on a supervising a study abroad program with students and we were in Nepal, uh, not far from uh, India. And we were visiting a couple of the villages and there was just no young women there. And I mean from like 14 to late 20s. And we didn't really kind of talk about it and we were there on this kind of very, you know, structured uh, abroad program. And then it came out at the end uh, that people had been migrating uh, to work in carpet factories. This is again 1997, 1998. So this is before we had any legislation about violence against women, before we had termed this coin human trafficking. And there were these migration routes because people have migrated for employment for thousands of years and uh, they were going to carpet factories, which was actually just kind of a pseudonym for these enormous brothel areas which exist in some of these um, areas and at the time nobody had been kind of talking about this and uh, along with another friend of mine we kind of decided that we wanted to do something about it and you know that led on a course which is never straight which is what I tell students right our life courses go up one and we make a left and we make a right and maybe we end up where we wanted to be but you know maybe we didn't know what we wanted and we end up someplace that's provided a long time of um, resources. But uh, so it's been, I guess that's 1997, that 23 years ago, is that right? So uh, it's been something that, uh, you know, once it gets inside your heart and your body, you can't kind of let it go. And so I'm gonna, you'll see some of that in this presentation, although most of this will be focused kind of on a general overview, which is a little challenging to do. And um, I will do my best to keep this um, about 25 minutes or so, 30 minutes, uh, and then Q&A, although as my students know, one of my favorite things to do is talk, so I'll try to be quick. <laughs> this is what the presentation is gonna look like. Um, we're gonna talk about just kind of basic foundations here, talk about some laws, some definitional things that are happening. Then we'll also look at global and national trends, and again, this is super challenging to do because trafficking looks different depending on where you are in the globe and depending on who you are. For example, so if I'm a law enforcement officer working intelligence, it looks a lot different than if I'm a public health advocate on the street. And one of the things that we're learning is trying to, to merge those views. So I'll talk about global national trends. Then my expertise is actually super local. So Oregon, Portland is where I've been really focused and really specific areas. So I'll spend kind of the bulk of my time, probably more slides than you want to have, uh, see on that stuff. And then at the end, we'll talk about future directions and challenges of where we're going. So first, just kind of basic definitions. And this has been in the news a bunch. We've been talking about this. So I think when I first did this, how many of years ago, it was actually, I think, when the first study came out, um, we didn't know too much about it. But this is how we frame trafficking as an issue. 
And the first definition is from something called the Palermo Protocol, which is the United Nations. And the second one is um, from what's called the Trafficking Victims Protection Act, which was first passed in 2000. And that actually first coined this term human trafficking that we use in parlance, that we use in law, that you see cited in cases, and a bunch of statutes that's been replicated. And uh, what that did is it broke it into two kind of categories. The UN, you see, doesn't do that. The first is sex trafficking. And the other one is pretty much everything else. And we'll spend time talking about kind of both of those and uh, kind of take a look at the numbers. Um, because in the beginning, we thought by far sex trafficking was the most prevalent, and it's actually not. It's a small percentage of the total trafficking in the world, which is labor trafficking. But what you basically need is the recruitment, transportation, transfer of someone through force, fraud, or coercion to do something illegal. And so it doesn't necessarily have to be like to sell drugs. It, it can be like if you're making somebody work for free, that's actually illegal. Now those rules apply unless you're a juvenile, unless you're a child. And if you're a child, you don't need that force, fraud, coercion element, of course, because we don't say that kids can contract consent to lots of different things, contractual issues, unless they're emancipated in one. So that's what trafficking is. Um, what's trafficking not? And this we still conflate a lot. It's not human smuggling, although that can change. And I'll talk about um, a situation that I worked on that actually did change a little bit uh, from the border where somebody came across voluntarily and then had his shoes taken and was forced to sell drugs in San Francisco. It's not adult consensual sex work. You know, that exists. Um, and when we conflate these, we do damage to communities, we kind of shift and dilute the focus from survivors and kind of other issues, and I'm happy to talk more about this at, at Q&A if you want to. It's not organ selling, although you can if you take somebody and don't tell them and then drug them and sell their organs, trafficking, but there's also, especially in some other areas of the world, people saying, yeah, you can have that kidney or you can have this part. Um, that's not it. And not international adoptions, which I've seen kind of lately, you know, Again, these elements can all be present, but it's just kind of not in the straight up definition. Because I was trained as a lawyer, that's generally where I go back to look at framing of things and, and history, I think is also really important to be able to set the context of especially current debates and the research that's been happening around trafficking. So the first act, the first thing was, uh, it's been actually around for a long time, so the Mann Act was passed, it was actually called the White Slavery Act. And uh, it uh, dealt with this fear of taking women and transporting them across state lines for the purposes of commercial sex. Again, uh, interested in that, happy to talk about that. Um, and then, as you can see, uh, it took, and there are some other statutes in the interim, but 90 years later, we finally passed what's called the Trafficking Victims Protection Act. And this did a couple of things. It, said this is a crime and it out defined it. The other thing it also did was create some government entities. Um, and I know there are probably some folks in here that have worked with the State Department or Foreign Service. Um, and it created the um, government uh, office to monitor and combat trafficking in persons, which puts out a report and was kind of one of the forefront leaders from the State Department that worked on this issue and was instrumental in my career and we worked very closely with them. That's been reauthorized several times, and there's several amendments to that. Then after that, we passed the PROTECT Act, um, and this deals with online um, sexual exploitation of children, but it also is one of the first laws that says if you go somewhere out of the country to have sex with a child, we actually now have jurisdiction when you come back to the United States to put you in jail, um, which is kind of a big thing because jurisdictional issues are generally based on kind of sovereignty in these issues, and again, the final uh, last two pieces of legislation is FOSTA and SESTA. And uh, what these, and these are quite controversial. Uh, and there are many communities that don't agree with them. Uh, and what they did was they took away some of the safe harbor regulations um, on online resources. So if you're running an online company and any part of that can be you know, traced to trafficking or you're benefiting from somehow, um, they can actually come in and, and shut down, which sounds, you know, in theory, like that's something you would want to do, but the unintended consequence of that is to drive work underground, um, and it's kind of push things further to the margins. Again, I'm happy to talk about the controversy surrounding some of those if you're interested um, as well. 
Okay, the Trafficking Victims Protection Act, we just kind of talked about a little bit. Um, that set it out, it was 2000, um, and it literally sets the stage. And the reason this is important is because we define and we understand human trafficking in the United States as a law enforcement issue. It's been over the last few years, uh, and there's been a couple of great articles published on how it can be looked at from a public health perspective. And my work is really at the intersection of criminology and public health and kind of looking at those issues and taking a different frame. But because this is the first way we defined it, there was an emphasis on rounding people up, arresting them, putting them in jail, and we didn't have what I would call the most survivor-informed approach. And again, there's lots of examples of that. If we talk about T visas, because there's special visas that you can get if a trafficking victim, we can talk about how that goes. But, but the ideas were prevention, prosecution, and protection. And so big law enforcement focus for some of those things. Okay. The types of trafficking we've talked about um, a little bit, and most folks know, and again, um, these are, even these categories become controversial, right? Because there are some groups that say, well, it's all really just labor trafficking, and these are just subsets. So when you like, you know, when you separate out commercial sex work, what you're doing is you're saying that's not labor, and so there, you know, there's lots of stakeholders that come to these groups, so this is just for the purposes so we can kind of have this discussion here. The common forms that you hear about are sexual exploitation, these are both of adults and children. Remember the big difference here um, is this force, fraud, and coercion, especially with adults. Uh, for children that are involved in this area, there's not, you know, uh, those requirements aren't there. Labor exploitation, which is actually the largest part um, and the largest form of trafficking uh, globally. Um, and then parts of labor exploitation are domestic servitude. So these are instances where you're bringing people in to work in your home and you're not paying them. There have been a couple of notable high profile cases, both abroad and in the United States, of both um, foreign diplomats uh, here doing this. And I can't, I don't know if there's any US diplomats abroad. Forced marriage, uh, and this is a relatively new category, um, and in many parts of the world, you know, we, we consider 18 an adult here, and that's just not the case in many parts of the world, especially where you have traditions of familial working, and, you know, where you have economic structures that are set up a little different, and this is one of them. So this has been a later inclusion, but if you include forced marriage for people that are of a certain age, the numbers skyrocket, and again, we can talk about that. Um, Forced criminality, and uh, I can, I, I have, um, and this is where you're recruiting somebody to literally do something illegal, uh, operate a theft ring. We saw it several years back, actually, here in Portland. Um, this is about 2000, where there was a ring bringing up these 13, 14, and 15 year old kids from areas of Honduras and Guatemala. And we were processing all these cases, and on Monday morning at the DA's office, you get a stack of cases, the arrests that would be made, and like half of them would be these kids that were busted for selling drugs on the east side meth, uh, max tracks. And Portland back then looked very different than it did today. Um, and you know, it just never kind of occurred to us that you know, these kids are voluntarily traveling 4,000 miles to sell drugs in this one specific area um, until we actually had a kid talk to us and tell us, and that kind of led to a whole of things, and it actually led to one of those uh, juveniles getting the first T visa here in the state of Oregon. So, you know, you're looking at things, and you see the whole picture, and it just, it, you, it's just, it's hard to do, and you don't. Uh, child soldiers, also kind of a big issue that we have in different areas around the world, and I'll talk specifically about that because there's some specific legislation. And then organ harvesting, so taking somebody specifically for the purpose of having some type of organ that they're taking from them. Okay, globally, how many victims or survivors? So trafficking is documented in every country in the world. It touches every... Um, industry somewhere along the line, a chain of production. Not, not many, many of them, especially because the globalized nature of the market. It's some area, there's some labor that's being exploited at some level there. Uh, GTIP, which is the Office of Modern and Combat Trafficking Persons, estimates about 25 million people worldwide. Um, and then ILO is the International Labor Organization, and they estimate about 77 of those are trafficked internally. Here's why the asterisk is there. I hesitate to talk about numbers, and I've done so for a long time. So this is a big buzz in the academic community if you're looking at trafficking, is measuring prevalence. How many survivors, how many victims there actually are? 
and nobody actually knows how to do it. So for all of our numbers and all of the regression analysis and these capture, recapture, statistical analyses, which I don't understand because I'm an ethnographer and a legal researcher, which means I, at its core, I just collect people's stories. Um, it's very, very challenging. So you're gonna see lots of numbers thrown out here and I'm happy to talk about some of the methodological implications, but it's just super hard to kind of get a handle on how this is looking worldwide. And one of the big problems is because definitionally, we don't ha we're not all on the same page. And again, I'll talk about this later, but as a law enforcement officer, prosecutor, the first thing I did years ago was say, okay, let's go to Portland police and see how many trafficking victims or survivors they had. And there was like one. And we knew there's not just one trafficking case in Portland. So we had to kind of expand that. But those definitional areas, we're still doing. Okay, so this is um, International Labor Organization, which I think is generally a really good source to use because they're pretty good on their data. And this just kind of breaks down the pictures that we've had. And this picture has changed a bunch, but as you can see, kind of the majority is this forced labor in this green part. And that's because a lot of the world works on debt and peonage systems and indentured servitude still, where you're paying off these debts over and over. Um, also, who is being trafficked? They looked at here. So, um, you know, overwhelmingly, you have, and, and ILO has a separate category for kids, but for the purposes of here, they're included here. Um, it's about 60% men, 40% women in the labor economy, and then sexual exploitation is overwhelmingly uh, women, overwhelmingly. Um, although there are instances, of course, of both. And again, this looks different wherever you are. So you can be in certain areas of... Um, Southeast Asia, for example, or certain areas of South Asia, where all there are are you know transgender commercial sex workers, and some of them are trafficked, and some of them are not. So th remember, it looks really different depending on the areas you are, which is why this is kind of a challenge. But just to get you some overall trends, so this is another way to kind of look at this. When so this goes back to 2005 you can kind of see where we are at. Like we thought sexual exploitation was the very top. I don't know if this has, I hate to press anything else on this. If this has a, um, where we thought sexual exploitation is at the top and you can see those numbers have been going down and labor has been going up. So whether these numbers have been going up because we're just more aware of it and we're getting better or methodological understanding or whether they're going up because they're really going up, that's a really challenging thing to tell. Um, what we do know is we can chart some things that happen. I'll talk a little bit about this later on. So when we're, there are trouble, you know, economic crisis, right, and we need workers in certain areas, trafficking goes up in those areas. We know that when certain areas become flush with cash, other types of trafficking go up in those areas. The other thing that we're starting to pay attention to, and I'll talk about this, um, is in 2004, we had the tsunami in um, the Bay of Bengal area. So I was there about four weeks afterward, and we also know that when you have large natural events, which we're getting more and more of, you also have exploitation that goes up because you have migration patterns, you have displacement of people, and if you don't have those protection measures in place, then you just have people that kind of pick them off and put them into other areas where they can make money. I mean, this is, uh, this is driven a lot, you know, by the global markets that we have and the nature of the economic systems that we have. Because every trafficker that I've ever met, everyone that I've enter, interviewed is interested in getting paid, whether they're working on labor or commercial sex work um, or selling child soldiers. Okay, uh, this uh, is a poor map uh, overview, but uh, this is something that the uh, U.S. government produces, and uh, the way that the GTIP office categorizes the world is they put it into cat tiers, tier one, tier two, tier three, and then tier two is divided into like tier two watch list. And so the countries in the blue are called tier one, and what they do is they look at the laws that have been uh, established, they look at the execution of those laws, they look at some of the support mechanisms, and they make these determinations. And so you can kind of see how the world looks, right, in terms of who's working, who's working on trafficking. And again, this is totally based on perspectives, right? So the way that this is generated, um, 
or the way it has been generated in the past is the State Department reaches out to their embassies and consulates and then they have um, officers that are in charge. There's a trafficking officer, depending on the size of the consulate or the embassy, that kind of works on this and works through reports. So folks that need to have more work, you can see, and again, this is just one perspective, and then there's sanctions and a whole bunch of other details that if you want on how these get developed and then actually what happens. Okay, so it, it's so hard to present like a challenge of what's happening around the globe. Um, at a very general sense other than kind of giving you that. So I just picked out a couple of examples here that you can kind of take a look at and see. Um, so one of these issues you can see in Yemen, this ongoing conflict um, has led to lots of child soldiers, which is a big issue in conflict zones where they need people and certainly very well documented cases. Um, and a book called Lost Boys that was out, I was going to say a few years ago, but it's more than a few years ago now, right? It's probably a decade, um, talking about uh, child experiences in Africa and finding their way back to the States, but well-documented systems that work there. And then also, um, in, 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 and then this was India, and you can see lots of areas there. Um, you know, bonded labor in the caste system has been abolished. Uh, since uh, 54, but it still exists in lots of places, South Asia as well. So you have these arrangements that still exist for literally millions and millions of people where you have debt bondage, you have peonage systems. Um, and I, did a, a, I had the chance to work with a great project about 12 years ago um, called the Barefoot Lawyers. And it was in these rural areas of India where they would train these workers on very basic kind of social justice. It was a group of lawyers, right, that would go out and train them, you know, to get, you know, what are actually your rights? What does the law actually say and have courts that enforce that? And the government of India has actually tried to do a really good job of setting up separate systems for this. And so, you know, there's little things that happen all over and then local communities tend to try to find solutions to some of these things. Okay, so, um, Actually, I wanted to, before I talk about this, I wanted to go back and talk about uh, two issues. Um, one, you know, one of the other issues I think that we talk about that people conflate a lot is smuggling and trafficking. So, um, you know, depending on who you listen to, there may or may not be a crisis at the border, right? I'm not going to, don't want to talk about the wall or any of those things. But what I will talk about is um, folks have been coming, you know, here across the border for many, many years, especially as borders have shifted. Um, and that in itself is not trafficking, right? You pay uh, what they call a coyote to take you across voluntarily, but many times those highly exploitive situations turn into trafficking. So I uh, did some work in San Francisco about eight years ago where there was actually a court case. Somebody came across the border um, without proper paperwork. Uh, it was not the first time they had done that. They got to Phoenix uh, in July, and the first thing they did was they put folks in a room and they took their shoes. Why do you think they took their shoes in July in Phoenix? <laughs> Has anybody been there, right? Like, I've been like in the Negev in July. I don't think I've ever been any place that's as hot as Phoenix in July. So they can't go anywhere. They were there for construction jobs. They told them the construction jobs were not available for them. Um, and after keeping them, kind of disorient them in this house a little bit, they moved several of them to several cities in California. And the particular case I was involved with was in San Francisco, where they uh, put one of these individuals there, who's 24 year old, and said, you know, handed him some crack cocaine, took him to a place called the Tenderloin, and said, this is what you're gonna do to earn your money. He wasn't a very good drug dealer. He got busted in about 25 minutes um, after he made one, one exchange. Um, and they actually told him to swallow the drugs. Uh, and, you know, he, he spit, you know, he spit them out or else he would have certainly died. Um, and so, you know, the question was, this is forced, right? And there are these duress defenses in California. And so we talked about this issue and this kind of ring that had come up here. Um, and the jury actually ended up, didn't buy the duress defense and convicted him and it went up on appeal. But it's just kind of one example. This uh, 2019 list is the um, Child Soldiers Protection Act. And again, another large issue that you see here, this is just a list of these countries that have been accused of using child soldiers in their conflicts. 
And the one other thing I will say here is that we are paying much more attention to conflict zones, but also natural disaster zones. As environmental refugees become a real thing, like they've been a real thing for a while, but as this increases over and over again, especially in areas of the world that seem to get hit over and over again. So the Bay of Bengal, you know, all those areas there, just from a geographic perspective and environmental perspective, you have a lot of environmental refugees and conflict zones. So we do see these things that increase over time over those areas, and we're just starting to kind of figure this out as well. In the United States, um, after Katrina in New Orleans, we had allegations as well, and I'm not kind of sure whether those actually turned out, but you see an increase in exploitive environments, and when you do that, you see an increase in trafficking. Okay, here's trafficking in the United States, um, and same, same issues here, uh, domestic labor, sex trafficking. We have a specific category, and this is kind of the area that I've worked in, and that's CSEC, and what that is commercial sexual exploitation, exploitation of children, and uh, I'll talk about kind of that in detail. Also, lots of labor exploitation um, in agriculture, and then traveling groups, I'm not even sure if this is a thing so much anymore, um, but these would be these groups of uh, teenagers that they come and they're like, you're going to go sell these magazines for hours a day. And there have been some documented cases of this. Again, I'm not sure it's prevalent, but it talked about the, one of the ways that we report trafficking is we call things in to the, there's a hotline. And uh, there was 9,000 cases of trafficking in 2017 to the hotline that is almost certainly underreported. If that wasn't bad enough, uh, so we just finished up a project on something that we've been working on for a while, and that's actually trafficking of people with disabilities um, in the United States. I'm sure it must happen abroad. I just haven't done that, but we just spent some time with a graduate assistant and examined almost every single court case in the United States that this has come up. And they're pretty heartbreaking, but in every area that you can see, um, and you know, particular attention, I would say, it has increased, and the interaction with opioids and the drug crisis and addiction has come up a lot, especially because a lot of folks are on meds, and we've seen families that have kept, or even like foster care situations with, with folks like this, and they've just kind of taken meds and resold them, and, um, and that's actually an article that, uh, that Cardozo Law Review at Yeshiva is gonna be publishing. And so it's just something that we weren't aware of before, but as we dive deeper into this topic, we take a look at. Okay, so I'm not sure where I am on time, but um, I'll, uh, let's kind of shift focus. So we did the glo basic definitions, global stuff, talked about those different flows, focus that down to the United States, and let's talk about Oregon, because that's kind of where we're all sitting right now. So these are brand new numbers. These just came out within the last uh, 30 days, I would say. And uh, this was put out by the Oregon Department of Justice, um, who has a grant uh, from somebody in the State Department, uh, and they work on statewide task force. So one of the ways that the United States has chosen to address this issue is to develop these task force. So this is what has been reported. Um, from different counties. So Clackamas just last year reported 138, um, Kalamath nine, Multnomah County 2000, uh, not 2000, 208. So you can see kind of the counties and where they're looking. One of the challenges is people are counting a little different ways, right? And if, again, if you talk to, I, and I work very closely with the Multnomah County Sheriff's Office here, if you talk to the trafficking sergeant, she would say these are super low numbers and then she would show you her numbers, right? Which are different. So. So, but, but remember, these are folks that have been identified as trafficking victims, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. So locally, what does this talk about? Um, so yeah, the first study was 2013, so I think that's actually seven, seven years ago. And we've done four, other, what, four total since then, just kind of based in this area, and I'll talk about that. So the first one was just to, and again, seven, this is seven-year-old data. Um, was just to establish a scope because there was federal legislation coming down, there was a brand new U.S. attorney in town, and she wanted to kind of dive into this issue. She had a child welfare background, said, I think this is happening with gangs, but I'm not sure. And so uh, I was a little reluctant, but you know, U.S. attorneys can sometimes make you want to do things that you're not that excited about at that point. So I did, and that was seven years ago, and I'm still doing it. Um, so what we actually did is we just did a count 
and we took DHS, the state agency, and we took one nonprofit, SARC, which is no longer doing this work, the Sexual Assault Resource Center, and we were, didn't want to overcount, and we said, okay, let's take a look at your data from four years and actually see if we can do some identifiable things here. I put this up here because this issue comes up, it was prevalent 10 years ago and it's prevalent today, and that's who gets to count. So I said I was a prosecutor, which is my background, so I naturally went and looked at how many prosecutions we had, and if you got, if you made it through the prosecution process, you know, and the person was convicted, then any person that they had contact with that you know, was a victim is now counts as a victim. What's the problem with that, you think? Pardon me? What do you think about? Oh, they could go back, yeah. We're not going to get a lot of robust data, right? Because the prosecutions are very small. Because in order to get to fall into the criminal justice system in this realm, right, you have to have criminal activity, has to be investigated, has to go to the district attorney's office, has to pass a grand jury, has to be taken to trial. And people were pleading out for lots of different issues here. So what we did is we did uh, we went to work with the Department of Human Services and they had a child hotline. We looked at those cases that had some evidence of trafficking where there was an identifiable victim and we used that as our starting point to count. This was, this was about a five hour discussion in, the, discussion in the basement of Burnside, which is out on East County where DHS officers were. And I knew I had reached, I, I knew I had reached, a, we had reached a good decision at the end of our meeting because everybody was mad at me at the end of the meeting, right? So you know you've, met, you know you've got a good compromise when people are really mad at you, right? So you're like, okay, it's time to go. So what did we find? 469 unduplicated survivors. There was 159 open cases, which is part of the second study we did, but who were they? 15 and a half was the first year of contact, so that we know the exploitation was happening when? Before then, right? So if we're designing intervention strategies, we need to kind of like high school is too late, right? We're, we're, we are missed the boat. Um, and again, we weren't very sophisticated in asking questions, especially about sex and gender and especially about race. And as a researcher, you look at things, you think you've got it, and then you're like, you know what? I made some mistakes. I need to kind of go back and work some of those things. So we become much more sophisticated about this stuff later on down the road. Other key findings, uh, almost 17% of trafficking survivors had children of their own. So when you're designing intervention strategies, right, that, that's a big part, right? Young parents takes up a large part of your life, those have, you know, had children here. So um, also 62% uh, of youth served by SARC had struggled with addiction, and it only says SARC here because DHS wasn't tracking this stuff at this point. So this is the really early days. Nobody really knows how to count. People are doing it different methods. Um, we had, you know, I was on the phone a lot with different states at the time talking about kind of how we structured some of these things. 20% had a, ham a family history of exploitation. Again, designing intervention strategies. These are things that we look for. Over 11% had been exploited by a family member. So we talk about familial trafficking or intergenerational trafficking now, and we can see these, and you can talk to folks in law enforcement that will say, oh yeah, I have the parents and the kids now, right? Doing some engagement in some area. The gang connection down here, again, is probably the weakest part of this research, just because we hadn't really defined it all that much, but there was this connection at the time it was happening. So, that was the first study. The second study, what we did, um, so we just had to standardize that stuff. But what we did for the second study, so here we took a look at who our demographic was to get some basic understandings. The other part that we were really interested in, the field workers, the frontline workers, the DHS, CSEC workers, and, and I, I, it's hard to describe. You know, they worked in the basement at this place in Burnside, and they had, I went maybe it was even pagers back then, um, cell phones, and they would go off 24-7. So you, your, your job isn't nine to five when you're working with these young adults. It's all the time. And so we really wanted to kind of talk to them, and so what we did is we took 44 of their open cases, and we said, okay, what makes an open case? Because we know those kids are getting services, and the other ones may not be, and what are the interesting demographic characteristics and comparisons about those? Well, the age goes up a little bit, little more mature, um, 
the gender, and again, this is, again, you can see, like, we wouldn't run this today, right, with just these two categories, for sure. We're missing a whole other groups that don't identify this way. So again, one of the, one of the issues that we had. Um, and then you can see how the race breaks up, and again, you also hear with statistics have reporting requirements. So there's federal privacy regulations that say you have to have a certain amount of people in order to report that number. In order to protect that, research have to do these things like combined categories, which is not ideal for us, but it's better than not reporting at all. So, and so this is just some key comparison findings. Um, you can see the number of kids that, are, that have kids go up. Maybe there's something there, not really sure. Um, and then these are kind of the avenues of exploitations of, and, and a lot of this also turns on how we ask the questions, right, as most research does, which is why you try to do it from different perspectives and go through different avenues. But you can see what happens here. This family exploitation stuff goes way up, which means that if folks are on the radar of DHS and public health officials, then we can kind of bring them into the system at an earlier age, which becomes really important in the next couple of slides. Um, developmental and mental health, you can see this, 75% have a mental health diagnosis, that is gonna go up. So trafficking people, you know, with some sort of disabilities, whether that's physical or intellectual, stuff we didn't recognize before, for sure. Um, and then almost all of them, a large majority, had previous sexual exploitation or abuse. Okay, so this uh, slide um, is also kind of was, was, became very important to me because what it did is it um, took over the next uh, four years of my life. And uh, this is this child welfare history stuff. So 45% of the youth in this sample, the previous sample, they, um, they had some contact with the child welfare system between zero and two. Now kind of isolating exactly what that uh, contact was, I'm not sure, but that means is that these kids weren't unknown to us. That had we been better, had we known, you know, had we been able to understand these risk factors, we probably could have done something. 95% were in foster care, which makes sense, right? So don't you know, there have been these studies that come out that say the foster care system causes trafficking. It, it, it doesn't, right? That is like an oversimplification and it's just not, my experience has not panned out that way. And I'm gonna talk about that because the last study was all about foster care. Um, but the populations that we worked with DHS, a lot of them had touched foster care. And then 45% 45 uh, of the youth had a sample, had a history of involvement with the juvenile justice system, which means they're there for other crimes as well, which means you have this concept of crossover youth where you, they don't just show up in one area. They show up in juvie or they show up at DHS or they show up in some other form of delinquency proceedings. This area is... So this is, I was looking at this data, and this is an interdisciplinary problem. And as you know, my, um, I was trained as a lawyer, and my doctoral work is actually intercultural communication. I'm an ethnographer, so I took this to one of my social work colleagues, and uh, she's like, well, you should look at this issue. Um, so if you're, depending on when you enter the foster care system, your average is about placement rate about 2.9, almost three families. But if you're a CSEC kid, that, you multiply that by almost four, you go up to 11 or 12. And that becomes a huge, huge problem. And she said, this is a huge glaring issue which I didn't even recognize. So we looked around the country and we said, well, certainly somebody way smarter than us has looked at this and actually nobody had done. So we'd finished this up. This, this foster care study just got finished up and I'm just about to wrap up um, about nine months ago. And, uh, and if you've been reading the papers, you know that we have a foster care crisis generally, but it's particularly acute here in Oregon. So we were housing kids in hotels. And, and if you interview these folks, not just the foster care workers, but families, but the placement, the people who place it, it is, it is probably the highest stress job I've ever interviewed and talked to because the stress on these folks is so high to place kids 
and it's just, we just don't have enough families going around. So what did we did? We cracked open, we talked to uh, 24 separate families that had been working, we tried to get a, a smattering around the state of who had been doing what, and if you know, people ask me what's the best way I could help, I say figure out how to foster or mentor one of these kids, because by far that seems to be the most effective way that we did. What's the snapshot? And remember, we were really interested in youth that had been in foster care because we know that they had been switching families a lot. And for a population that had been in unstable, exploitive environments, the worst thing that you can do is keep jumping environments because then you never understand the structural flows that happen. And um, these were caring, loving families. And but unless you're equipped with the tools, a trauma-informed approach to understand what a survivor has been through and triggers and PTSD, it, it becomes very, very challenging. And it takes a toll not just on the youth or young adult, but it takes a toll on the families as well. And once we lose a foster care family, they're gone. The stats are really hard on trying to pull those facts back in the mix. 14 years old on average, the average stay uh, a week. Uh, I think why, we actually had one that only stayed for four hours and then uh, ran away. Over half of them run away, right? So foster care families have to be willing to take them back if they're going to work with this population. Um, and then these stats are also big, right? 100% had a diagnosed mental health disorder. Um, and then you can see as we become more sophisticated and identifying different youth, right? Like that don't that don't identify in this bivariate model, right? Does that take care? Does that take understanding? Are there different services that are available? Are there different needs, right, to talk to somebody? And in, there are, actually. Um, and then 70% had come into the contact with the juvenile justice system, and 90% had used controlled substances. So a lot of these things you see are just areas where we could do points of intervention. So this was a qualitative and quantitative research project. The stories are long, and they're they're brutal. Like, I've, I've done some things in other areas of the world, and this, this was the hardest, I think. Because you can feel, just from like these quotes that we pulled out, um, like the second one is just killer. I try to get through this without crying. But it, if you showed kindness, if you showed forgiveness, if you sat and stopped what you were doing to give her five minutes of your time, the confusion on her face, that's what I found so offensive. No child should be confused by parenting or love. So remember, this isn't you know, these aren't like academic researchers. These are the families that live day to day and are working, you know, with the youth and the kids. And it's just, it's challenging. And one of the things it tells us is that we're, we're like, we're starting too late, right? If this, if they go through this process, we need to do things that we can do earlier. And, you know, fortunately, there's some kind of work that's being done on that aspect. This is the various roles that foster care parents pay. <laughs> I mean, this is the last slide on this part. And so you can just see we asked them to carry a lot of roles. We need to provide more support. But it is probably one of the most effective tools that we have to work with kids that have been through this area. So uh, this is kind of the end part. And then I'm going to open it up. But uh, you know, challenges, it's a super difficult research area. We still have these definitional problems, as you see. We're still conflating sex work with trafficking, which of course is another issue. And then future directions. Um, foster care work has been here a bunch. I think it's a huge thing that we can look at. This predictive modeling is really new, but it's starting to put databases together because we understand what the risk factors are. And if we just have enough information, then we can say, you know, now we have intervention strategies, but they're not based on what I would call solid statistical evidence of this is what kids need or this is what adults need at a certain area. And of course, it varies by region. But now what we have the ability to do, and we're just starting to break ground here, is say these are the risk factors in this area. And you can break it down by census block. So then you can actually design intervention programs. You can work in schools. You can design public health programs and interactions with law enforcement to do that. We've started a study of graduate students that are working on purchasers, which is what we call the demand side. Uh, there's two reacher colleagues that are starting to look at missing populations. This is uh, Native women, and these seem to be tracking development of actually pipelines and these big kind of uh, pipeline development areas, which happen, seem to happen um, around Native Americans or uh, poor observations. Um, we're looking at familial 
trafficking is now we're having more, and then there are more nuanced understandings. So we had a graduate student last year that just did a study of tattoos, traffickers that came on with tattoos. So this is a little jarring, but I just want to show you stuff that we're looking at. Like these would go by, and we wouldn't think anything of it, but now we know. And in fact, we've seen some of the same tattoos over and over again, not just here, but in other places. And so now they can start to connect the dots. and. Um, and so, and this actually has been kind of tested in court and those sort of things. So those are the areas that we're at. Um, there are lots of local resources. The kind of catch-all one is the County Sex Trafficking Collaborative, um, and they have a bunch of resources and folks that are working, so are optimists, the Rotarians, uh, the Junior League is doing that. We also do labor trafficking research here, which is outside kind of the area that I've done, but we have started, right? There's a couple of folks working on this issue and we're starting to see some kind of agricultural things come up. And then with a lot of migrant labor, we've had allegations for a while, um, but again, challenging populations because you know they're mobile to work with. And then the other thing is I thought I would give a shout out. So uh, my kid's an eighth grader and she said, dad, you should look at what my colleagues put together. And it's actually, I mean, I can't believe they're eighth graders that put this together. But if you're interested in kind of timely stuff, I'll get that link to Tim. And these were eighth graders at Da Vinci Middle School, like right across the river, that put this like 10 minute video together. And I was like, wow. You know, I'm just always kind of amazed at what kids do when they get passionate about issues. So those are the resources, those are the areas. And that's what I got. So I'm happy to answer questions if you have them. Thank you. Just a reminder, we need to have short questions because we're tight on time. Thank you. I noticed in that we had a list of foster parents for CS, CSEC kids. Right. It said that 100% had a mental disorder and 90% were on controlled substances. How did they get picked as foster parents? No, 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 Those, not the foster parents. Those are the kids, the kids they work with. Yeah, we wouldn't get, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, not a very clear slide probably, yeah. Yeah, we wouldn't do so that. So it, yeah. it must be really hard to get to find parents to take those kind of type of kids in. Um, you know, that people that have worked in the foster care system, they're like, yes, absolutely. And uh, it's amazing the amount of people that would do it but for the hurdles that they have to jump through and some of the internal problems in the system of working with DHS and, you know, working with other groups as well. Not, I mean, not just DHS, right? The it's not the people, right? The structures are set up. There's not enough resources to work with foster care families. There's not enough families. Or, so all those things put a strain on the system. But, you know, we found that actually the foster care families that are working with Oregon Youth Authority they, I mean, they report great results. And again, lots of structural, much smaller population. But we can do it. I mean, we can do it. And there are families that want to do it. We just have to reduce some of those barriers and increase some of the supports. Thank you uh, for the information you provided. Um, and I appreciate you presented a, a great, even recent historical perspective. Could you talk a little bit about what the implications of the crackdown on immigration has been? Uh, at, on, on the one hand, at the federal level, but also the impact on agencies like the State Department and their trying to look at this issue internationally from the perspective of this administration. Yes, yeah, so, um, I mean, I can speak on that a little bit. You know, to the extent that we, you know, there's limited resources, right? ICE has DHS and Department of Home has limited resources, and some of them can get devoted to cracking open trafficking rings, but most of them aren't there, right? They're diverted to other things, people coming across the border, some of the other raids that we've had. So um, it's, it's hard to get a numbers, like on how many folks coming across the border, but, but I will say this, as you make it more challenging to cross, right, as you close off those easier ports of entry, what you, because people are still coming across, right? The economic situations have not changed in Mexico and some of the, and, and, and the kind of pipeline that comes through here, and even other countries, right? I was in a detention center in Mexico City several years ago, and I would say probably 40% of the people there were not from um, Latin or Central America, right? They had come in there through other ways. But as you push people out to the margins, you increase avenues of exploitation, and you increase, avenues that traffickers can work. Because now you've got to go 
300 miles or 200 miles out in these areas. And the further out you go, these are already exploited groups. And so then they become more isolated and more exploited. So, so that, you know, that's the one thing I can say about the relationship. Thank you, Dr. Carey. Could you comment on some of the other uh, maybe plans that other states have? I think there's a Tennessee project that puts more resources into helping the families so that they could take care of their own children to begin with. When you say families, what do you like? The families who are in crisis so that uh, the, the children uh, hopefully can stay with these families and not be removed in the first place? Right. So uh, Tennessee is actually a really good example. So they're like have reversed a lot of these trends that the other states have been working on. And, you know, I'm honestly going to say I have, I have, and so they've done a great job because they've worked on early. They've devoted a lot of resources to try to keeping families together from a bio, biological families because families are defined lots of different ways, right? Um, keeping them together and working within that familial structure. And so, um, and, and that's been a really good approach, right? With a really focused resource intervention approach and lots of supports to help that. They've done a wonderful job. Um, you know, in this state, we have a really strong emphasis on kind of getting families back together. And honestly, from the research, I've got some mixed feelings about that, right? Um, I've seen some instances where, in my opinion, right, and if you talk to other folks, they'll give you different opinions, that we've, we've uh, tried to put young adults and kids back in situations because they're biological connections, but absent that biological collection, you would never put a kid back in this environment. And so, as we, so early on, I think it's an amazing strategy. I think we should get our hands around it and kind of leisurely kind of look with the laser beam focus on that. As we move throughout the process, you know, you can see mixed results. It's definitely a case by case basis for sure. And I think that is probably a good thing to have as the presumption. But I also think we need to look at what's in the best interests, you know, and sometimes being, you know, if, if you, you know, all families have some levels of dysfunction, right? But, but if you're in that environment and the only tie is this biological connection and all of the other problems persist, I'm not sure that those problems are gonna go away. So that's not a 100% answer your question, but that's kind of the best I've got. So early intervention, I think, is a really good idea. And if we could develop that and focus it, it would be great. As we see later on the life course, it becomes more challenging. Great. <laughs> what do you got? Um, so I was just wondering, wow, um, when you're looking at the demographics of the victims in Portland specifically, do you ever like look at the ratio of the demographics of the city in comparison to see if any specific groups are disproportionately affected? Because yeah. I think Portland kind of has this misconception like it's this big safe haven for all when that's not necessarily true yeah. for a lot of racial minorities. Yep. Um, so uh, thank you for your question and it was something that was in Actually, I don't even know if it was up in there. So I don't know if you remember, especially with the African-American population, I can't remember what the numbers are, but uh, the overall percentage in the state, I think, is like 2% or something, and maybe it's 11 in Portland. I'm probably getting these numbers wrong. But African-American children, for example, are overrepresented by five times in this sample, five times. And so, you know, you see, and, and overwhelmingly, the purchasers are white, this is commercial, this is sex work, right? This is uh, sexual exploitation of children. So this is the one category. But if you look at overwhelmingly, the purchasers are white Caucasian males. And so you see these patterns of exploitation being repeated in other areas. So that's one, you know, that, so yes, to answer your question, and that's kind of the one example that we have here. And you see that represented in various different populations as well. Hi, could you just explain what you meant a little bit more about like we see rates of trafficked labor increasing and how certain areas are like flushed with cash and then we see trafficking going up? Sure. Um, so, um, so uh, this happened, this has triggered a couple of ways. Uh, when, so countries that have traditionally, uh, economists, measure, and a lot of them agree that one of the biggest factors to tell how a healthy economy is is a disparity of wealth, right? So you have a big disparity of wealth, you generally have big terms of exploitation. But in some areas, you have 
populations that have more cash, developments of middle class. We've seen this in a lot of Southeast Asian countries over the last 25 years and in a lot of South Asian countries in the last 25 years as well. And when you have a large class which is left out of the economic package um, and you have one sector of the economy that has more disposable cash to spend on things, then you see demand go up in areas. Commercial sex is one area but not the only area, also agriculture, label, labor, manufacturing process, development of food products in the supply chain. So when that goes up, when you have one segment of the population that gets infused with money and cash and you have others that aren't, then what you have is that demand skyrockets, but the economic benefits don't. And you have situations that become ripe for exploitation. And that's what I mean in that area. The other place you see is when you have natural disasters hit and there's huge rebuilding issues or you just have large displacement and movements of people. People have been migrating you know, for thousands, I mean, that's how civilization has been formed. So the answer is not to shut migration down, right? That's not the answer. You can't, I mean, you can build all the walls you want and you're not gonna shut it down, right? What you're actually gonna do is make the problem worse probably in some areas. And so it's how to reinforce those corridors, how to make those spaces safe, how to take a public health perspective on you know, economic growth and development and that stuff. So we're almost out of time, and before we thank the professor, I just wanted to highlight um, how exciting is the work that he's doing in this. I, this is one area that I can say from experience as a foreign service officer mm -hmm. that the United States sometimes uh, is behind the trend. This is one area where, as you saw, for those who read the article, um, because you can mobilize the power of all those embassies and consulates throughout the world, uh, as an offshoot of the Human Rights Report, you have data and information that we're able to gather that leads to looking into this, which is really, to a certain extent, cutting edge compared to other organizations in the world. And so while a lot of times, you know, the U.S. government is behind the curve on this, this is one area I would say that we're out front, and while it's not perfect um, by any stretch, um, it, it is really striking. So if you haven't read the article, it makes some good points. Uh, to, to um, back up what the professor was saying about how, how this really helps to encapsulate you know, what the, what's going on uh, out there in, in other parts of the world that really not a lot of organizations are looking at. So how about a big hand for our professor today? Thank you. So, and I also want to just sort of cap things off a little bit. Um, are you familiar with the Nest Foundation? I am. Yeah. yeah, so the Nest Foundation does um, some really, um, I, think, I think pretty, I don't know as yeah, a professional what you think, but some year, pretty innovative ago. work in the public schools where they are putting a curriculum into schools that are in neighborhoods where people are, tend to be uh, targeted or vulnerable for trafficking. And I was really impressed with, I moderated a panel with a bunch of these kids who had gone through the program, and they were actually saying they wished that probably around the fifth grade, mm -hmm. that they had, been, um, they had been given sex education, and not sex education as mechanics, which is kind of how it's taught, but they really wanted to understand what a healthy relationship was. Yeah. And, and they, these kids learned how to also identify friends who may be targeted. So if you don't know about Nest Foundation, you should, you should look them up. Uh, it was based on a film called Playground by Libby Spears that um, was on Netflix for mm -hmm. quite a while. But um, I mean, there, this is happening all over our city and there are ways in which I think we can all be involved and more, more proactive. So again, big hand for, for Chris Carey. Thank you.